Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, can I be a bit bossy? I know you're sitting at the back there, but there's all these seats at the front and you're also, you're hiding the clock. <laughs> uh huh. So I'm just going to get you to either move the clock or yourselves. I don't mind which, but um, thank you very much. That would be great because the clock is very necessary when you're doing one of these things. It is indeed a delight for me to um, be asked to um, talk to Malcolm about his absolutely fabulous novel, The First Friend. Um, I read it while I was travelling overseas and I sent Malcolm a message saying, holy shit, it makes me laugh and it makes me sweat. And that is my overriding impression that this book is a, it's a tense and intense roller coaster ride, which is so timely. Like that was the impression I had constantly reading it, that this was a book that was exactly right for now. I mean, what's happening on the 5th of November? Of course, none of you know, do you? <laughs> Nobody knows that, yeah. So keep that in mind. So one of the first questions that came to my mind as I read this book, and I know you told me that this is the first question you get asked by everyone, so I'm not in any way trying to be original here. Um, I just think that if this is the first question, then this is the one that needs to be answered. And that is, you are a boy from the northern beaches, for <laughs> God's sake, and you're writing a novel set in 1938 in Stalinist Russia. Why? <laughs> <clears throat> um, thanks, Jane. And I will get to, to your question. Um, first of all, it's really nice to see the clock because it's on pre-daylight savings time. Yeah. And it means we have an extra hour. So <laughs> it's only 6.15 now. We've got two and a quarter hours until we're finished, which I'm really looking forward to. Awesome. Um, the, the, the second thing I just wanted to say before, before answering is there are three people here who I really, really want to thank up front. Um, there's Jane Porfriman, Ali Laveau and Krista Munns. Um, they, uh, they were my kind of publishing posse uh, for this book and have been for um, other books. We have a long um, history together and it's just, it's always a, a privilege to work with the best, um, the best of the best. And um, uh, thank you. And it's lovely to see you here. Um, now for the third time, I'm going to avoid <laughs> answering your question. This is very because... clever of you, Malcolm. <laughs> As I'm sure you know, um, very often with writing, it's um, go down the rabbit hole first and ask questions later. And it's I, what I'm trying to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was, I was well and truly off into the Republic of Georgia in 1938 um, before I could stand back and ask myself why, why am I here? Um, and, you know, should I get out of here? Um, and so when I answer the question, it's, it's retrospectively. I don't know what was in my head at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I can kind of guess and look, the, there, are, there are various long answers, but the short answer is the world we, we were all living in at that time, this is in 2020, 2021, um, it, it felt you know, so many things were lined up in terms of power um, above us. We were in, we were in um, Putin world, we were in Xi Jinping world, we were still in Scott Morrison world, uh, we were in the everlasting Trump world. Um, it, <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed, so. Um, not only those worlds, but worlds in my own life I'd been thinking about for a long time and um, you know, funnily enough, if you just extract the, the, the time, the name of the, the people, the time and the place, it, it felt to me as if this particular story in this particular time made sense, made sense of everything that I couldn't make sense of. Mm -hmm. And it, it gave me, because it made sense of it, it gave me some hope when, when I was feeling very 
I guess, angry and um, powerless, of course. Um, and, you know, your next question will be, you know, why did that particular world um, make such sense of it? And, you know, if, again, if I can extract it after the event, I, I think it's, it's having a resurgence right at the moment when you talk about November 5, that we are in wave after wave in this world of mind-bending um, mind bending resistance to truth, mm. where, where everything feels like it's wheels within wheels and no fixed point at, at which to, to anchor ourselves or to feel that others are anchoring themselves. And um, the, the consequences, when you have no anchor point, the consequences are you know, dizzyingly um, uncertain and frightening and of course you can't really write about that as it's happening because things move too quickly for you with Trump for example you just can't you yeah. can't make it up and you wouldn't want to make it up but with your editor wouldn't let you <laughs> they'd say no this that's right happen. that's right but with a bit of with a bit of you know historical perspective it did feel that the the essence of what worries us at the moment was what had been clarified about that regime at that time. And I've got to tell you, in early draft of the book, I, I tried to um, replace all the names, place names and, and individuals' names, and, and make it the same story, but not in um, Stalinist so Soviet Union. Mm. And when I was imagining then talking about the book or talking about the book to myself, I was always then just translating it back to this. So this character, blah, 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 is based on Leverenti Beria. This character is based on Stalin. This place is based on Georgia in 1938. So it seemed a little bit pointless to do that. And I went, I went back to the, the actual place and time. Do you think too that by setting it in <coughs> Stalinist Russia in 1938, you're writing both a warning, but you're writing it in a way that enables us to read it and think about it, and the worst I got was a heavy sweat, um, because horrible and brutal and murderous as Stalin's regime was, it ended, it stopped. Now, <laughs> there's Putin, so it hasn't all resolved itself nicely and neatly. But nevertheless, the thing about the past is, however terrifying it was at the time, it's over. <laughs> Does that give us a kind of buffer so we can look at it more clearly? Um, <clears throat> from a storytelling sense, yes. Um, but from a, in, in a human sense, I don't think it does at all. And, and the, the seeds that were planted, you know, the past is never really the past. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it felt to me, actually, it felt to me as if I was writing a contemporary Australian story. Uh, I never, when I was in that rabbit hole and executing it, I always felt that I was in our world and, and attaching Soviet names to it. And, and um, you know, if there was a cart, if there was an engine and, a, and a, you know, a carriage, the engine was the here and now, mm -hmm. and, and the carriage was all of the, um, uh, you, you know, the specifics of that world. So it, it never felt like it was that much in the past. Well, you give us a very broad hint of that when you use the um, phrase alternative facts right up the front of the novel. You, you, that is a big kind of, this is about today. And uh, you write it. I mean, one of the things that makes it so accessible is that it's such an Australian book. I mean, it's set in Russia, but it's such an Australian book. And there's something about your use of Australian vernacular which enables well, I've never heard it so scarily used before, frankly, um, and yet at the same time the familiarity of it. So I had kind of a completely double reaction. I was comforted and terrified all at the same time. And that to me is, there's something about that in this whole book. <coughs> the, the gaslighting, if you like, of the comforting thing that you suddenly realise is actually the opposite of comforting. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when I when I talk about personal experience, 
that personal experience for me is obviously in in the Australian vernacular and in Australian language and a, a, a way of kind of um, making that relatable is is through so there was a there was a person I used to work for and I think in this room there might be a couple of people certainly Deborah Snow wherever she is who'll know who I'm talking about who I, I didn't work under for very long but I retain this memory of him as the only truly evil person I've ever come across in, in, in my life. And, and if I imagine him in a place like Stalinist Russia, um, he would have been you, you know, one of the people at the higher tables signing the papers, um, doing, doing the dirty work. Um, and I was, I was certainly picturing him as, as my kind of central bad guy in the book and I was at dinner with somebody and we were talking about this guy and I said you know I, I worked under him for a while but I didn't know him well enough to have a lot of stories about him and this friend said this friend who knew him said well why don't you why don't you do a bit of research uh, and so I began contacting former colleagues of ours who knew him a lot better um, than I had, and we we're talking about events that had happened 25 years earlier. You couldn't shut people up; they they just wanted to tell story after story about this guy and what he did. And a lot of him has made it into the the barrier character in the book. And um, <laughs> because now that's just a life's achievement, things. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you just tweak things a little bit, and and there he is. And and he was a master of the Australian vernacular he was a very charismatic person a very a very funny person an admired person because he was good at his job but when he had these meetings with people the way they were described to me was that you know if there were 12 people in the room 11 of them would be laughing because the one he was picking on was not them and they were all laughing and sweating because i think thank god it's not me but it might be me next um, and some of the one-liners from Beria are his one-liners as well. And I've got a whole other um, storage unit full of his one-liners <laughs> one um, that I can use. And, you know, novelists, I guess, do this all the time. I've never, I've never heard Hilary Mantel talk about her, her Cromwell in the um, Wolf Hall trilogy, but I would imagine that he, you know, you can't get inside Thomas Cromwell's head from this distance, but... She got into his head by by um, superimposing, um, you know, people of her of her own experience, and, and that was what I was doing here. And he, of course, also had a psychotic boss, um, <laughs> because I suppose what your novel is really about, for me anyway, what struck me was it's about the use and abuse of power in the largest possible sense. Stalin controlling an entire nation, but also in the intimate and small senses of how power is used. And, you know, as you were talking about your evil boss, I was thinking about my evil client. And <laughs> <laughs> who, was a cla who, who, who was classic at being one thing one day and the complete opposite the next day, so that you never actually knew. And that is very much... It particularly struck me in your characterization of the steel one, I love that name for him, Stalin, that he was, nobody actually knew whether he would wax or wane from one minute to the next. And the power of that is so terrifying. Yeah, and, and you know, there were, it was a replicant system where um, you, you hear people on the next level down imitating his ways and then and then it was proliferating through the entire system but that you know that was also how that is also how I think a lot of us see um, you know a dominant power mode in our world can be replicated in you know it could be the the little dictator at the club you're a member of it could be the headmaster of a school that either you know your children go to or you went to yourself um, it could be a boss it could be you know, it could be a political person. It could be any anybody along the line. And the 
that um, characteristic you talk about with with Stalin that was that was replicated is, you know, I'd, I've read of him described as someone who was a, you know, a consummate actor, who fully inhabited every role he was playing, but the role could change from minute to minute, and he was, um, you know, he in our in our most of our kind of general idea of Stalin, he's black and white. Uh, he's in grainy footage. He's silent because there's very little of Stalin's um, voice recorded. He see, he just seems very, very stern. He's standing up there on top of Lenin's mausoleum, and he, you know, he looks kind of like a like a constipated bullfrog um, <laughs> overseeing a, a parade. If you if you look deeper at the at the witness um, testimonies, he was incredibly charming, and he would put people off balance with his sense of humour. And he did this, you know, he had these post-war peace conferences with, with Roosevelt and Churchill and their, their entourages. And their, the response was remarkably consistent that they expected one thing and they found another. Mm. And, and because it was so, such a contrast, and such a contrast with his status that, um, you know, he was known for... If, if he was here, he'd be ducking down to the kitchen to, to have a few words with, uh, with the, you know, the, the lowliest staff he could find. The proletariat. The proletariat. And, and, of course, they would be dazzled by it. It was like meeting a rock star, and, and that would hook them. And, and, and so they'd be waiting for another you know, touch from the golden finger. And even people like Roosevelt and Churchill, to some degree, became kind of fanboys of his. <laughs> And and so of course he got everything he wanted from those those conferences. It was a it was a perfect system of manipulating people, and of course those who worked with him, you, you know, who oh. who kind of filtered down through the book, could see how it worked, and um, you know they they uh, tried to replicate his techniques themselves. And what struck me about the first friend Murtov, who is a fictional character, of course. Mm -hmm is that he lived in a world where your brain is constantly going at a thousand miles an hour working out this is what he says, what does he mean? This is what he said happened, what really happened? How should I react? What's the right way to play this? So it's a kind of exhausting um, uh, scurrying that everyone is desperately doing with, as you said at the very beginning, no anchor point, no agreed um, kind of place that you can come from with a, a sense of security. Everything is chancy. Something that was perfectly fine yesterday could get you in a gulag or worse today. How, how do you think, I mean, it's interesting. The mother is about a coercive controller. The whole way through this, I'm thinking, this is about coercive control on a massive scale. But when you write about those relationships between Beria and Murtov, they went to school together, their power situation has completely flipped because Murtov and his father were the better off who took in this young boy. But now, I mean, and what happens to Murtov's father and, you know, all of that, it's been completely flipped. But that's an intimate, familial coercive controlling relationship. Yeah, and look, for those of you who haven't read the book, we probably skated pretty quickly over the, the basic setup of the book and we talked about... I got interested. About, that was my next question. Yeah, I got so interested. Stalin, Stalin, who we talked about, um, doesn't even appear in the book until until quite late. Um, he's, a, he's a kind of a, a an atmospheric presence rather than a physical presence. The, the setup of the book is um, it's about two friends um, and it's about a marriage. So our central character is a guy called Vasil Murtov who's a driver and a dog's body for the local gang boss. A, and do you want to say yeah. a little bit about Beria and who he was, just in yeah. case there are people in the audience who don't know? He's a real... He existed. So, the, you know, it is a gangster book and um, because the Bolshevik Party set up a, a gangster state, um, our... Our immediate boss is a guy called Lavrenti Beria, who was who was a real person, and this takes place at an early part of his life and and at the turning point of his life. So he was born in 1900 uh, in Georgia, as Stalin had been uh, born in Georgia. 
Beria was um, from a poor background. His mother, his mother basically sold him off to a, a, a wealthy family um, because she saw his potential. Um, they, they, his own family was very poor and his father had been uh, shot in a fight with a policeman when Beria was a kid. Um, his mother had him adopted out by, by this um, uh, bourgeois family um, in Georgia. Beria, Beria was very, very smart, but, but also incurably, um, uh, you know, he was psychopathic, but he was also embittered about, about his status and where he'd come from. Um, the character I've created the Sil Mert of is the, the brother, the elder brother in that family that adopted him. Um, when the Russian Revolution came around, Beria was only 17 years old, but he immediately became a spy um, and, uh, and, and very soon a member of the, of the secret police. He, he played both sides of the fence until he knew which side was going to win. Um, he, he was very young when the, when the Bolsheviks won in Georgia. He was only 21 years old. Uh, he rose quickly through the, the secret police. He had far greater pretensions um, and ambitions for himself. He didn't, he didn't think he was a backroom operator. He thought he was a ruler. And when he was 31, he was made ruler of um, the, the Caucasus. So three, three Soviet republics, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, this 31-year-old, you know, young, bald genius, um, got to be he the, the governor. He chilies constantly. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a true, true fun fact. He, he constantly had a jar of chilies in his pocket and, and chomped on them and they were really hot and he would offer them to people <laughs> and, and, see, and see what happened. Um, <clears throat> but he, he kind of, during the time which was, uh, you know, a particularly bleak time for um, Russia, which was the 1930s when Stalin was basically killing off all of the, the class enemies, killing off um, the, the ex, um, you know, imperial um, class, and then he began to kill off his own party members, which was the worst of it in the late 1930s. Beria was still ruling Georgia, and um, he thought he was setting himself up as the, the heir to, to Stalin. The, all of the action of the book takes place at this moment in 1938 when Stalin comes to Georgia, his, his homeland, for a big celebration, and Beria has the responsibility to, to make it all work. Um, he can't make it work too well because that would make him look good, which Stalin wouldn't want, but he can't make it fail either. So Beria is in a, in a heightened um, state of, of panic, and in the book we see Beria's true character revealed under pressure. Um, but at the end of it, I, I'm, I'm happy to give away the, the, the spoiler in a sense, because we know it from, from history. Beria got the big promotion to, to Moscow, which he was after, but it was also a demotion. So Stalin brought him to Moscow, but he put him in the secret police again. And he said, you think you're this, but I'm going to make you that. And I'm going to put you back in the in the in the dark corners, um, snitching on people, interrogating people, doing away with people. So the the Beria's um, arc in the book is of is of greater and greater panic, bringing out darker and darker uh, impulses from him, with a with a climax where he gets everything and yet he gets nothing mm. too. Murtov is his best buddy. And that arc of barriers makes him, his panic makes him more and more dangerous to anyone who has anything to do with him. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so Murtov um, in this world kind of has to play along. He, he's playing a number of games where he, he's kind of got to be dumb for Beria because playing dumb and being the loyal dog's body has been his, his avenue to survival. Um, but he's also got to present as very loyal. Um, Murtov is a married man with, with a, a, a wife who's a seditious um, academic. 
and two daughters who are who are in peril because um, from everything we know about Beria, he he liked young girls. So the stakes are extremely high, both for Murtov having to present having to be an actor himself. We talked about actors mm. before. He's got to be an actor, not only in his closest work <coughs> relationship, where he has to act a role and get Beria to believe in that role, but even at home, because at home every room was bugged. And not only that, he can't tell Babalina, his wife, what he's playing at, because to tell her would be to endanger her. So that the you know, to get finally to the the central relationship in the book, which is between Murtov and Babalina. It's it's everything you think of a marriage in a marriage with the you know the micro the micro politics and the micro um, you know every every little strand of relationship is in the context of life and death. Mm. So so the the little lies that I've written about before have the stakes of well they might, their marriage might fall apart, they might lose their house. Um, a friendship, a misstep in a friendship might lead to a, a falling out. In this world, it's the same, it's all the same chemistry, but what is at stake is life and death. And I guess that when you say you, you were sweating, um, that permeates the book because it permeated that world. But, you know, laughter, I think laughter is, is really close to, to sweating. I, I was on a plane not that long ago and the plane did that thing where um, it dropped mm -hmm. in a few seconds it, it dropped and it dropped so fast everybody you, you know they were hitting the top of their their um, seat belt straps um, nobody came out but for a few seconds everyone on that plane to 250 people thought mm -hmm. we're going down and, and you know what the reaction was immediately after? Nobody screamed. Everybody was laughing. Everybody and, and they were laughing and they began telling stuff to the stranger next to them. There was this atmosphere of kind of complete um, bonhomie and um, solidarity among the people and a lot of laughter, which, which was triggered by a moment of, you know, of terror. terror. And, and, and that... I think is in in this world that's where we live on that vertex between terror and laughter. Absolutely, and you capture that so brilliantly. The other thing that struck me is it's a world where people drink a lot. <laughs> now I understand that on one level because you know that level of tension needs an outlet, and alcohol is one way of dealing with that. She said, wondering why her glass was empty. Um, <laughs> but. At the same time, that's a high risk thing to do because it reduces your inhibitions. It makes you more likely to say the thing that's, you know, the forbidden thing that's actually going through your head. So even when they were seeking relief from the terror, laughter, brinkmanship, they were actually increasing the terror of any minute now you disappear. And the, the I mean, the relationship between Murdoff and Babalina is a lovely relationship. I mean, it's, it's a relief in many ways because they are two people you can like, you can care about, you can relax a little bit with. But at the same time, you feel the terror for them that they feel for one another and for their daughters. Yeah, well, you'll, you'll notice the, the book is mainly written through Murtov's point of view, but in the scenes where he's with Babalina, she's privileged with, with point of view. And, um, you know, she is, she is the fulcrum of the book because we can, we can only kind of unpick the, um, un, unpick the, the knot that is Murtov through her mind because he... He keeps implying to her that he's going to look after her and and the girls, and he, in his way, he's assuring her that he's got a plan. He's got it under control. He's got a plan. He's got it under. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about under control. 
<laughs> now you see, a hint always works. <laughs> Um, yes, vodka for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, he can't, he can't tell her in as many words because it's too dangerous to tell her um, he's in control. So she doesn't know how far she can trust him. She loves him. She loves him dearly. She wants to believe and she knows why he can't tell her. But how, how far will she let him go and how far can he play the role of dumb old Murtov in the family home. And yes, they know that every room is bugged, but there's a worse thing than that. Of the two girls, one of them, Melor, is completely um, overtaken by the propaganda that she is subjected to. And there is that terror that Melor would report on them if she heard something. Yeah, Mel Melor's drunk the Kool-Aid mm. and, and you know, Melor's first word she learns to write is, is Papa Stalin. Um, Stalin and, you know, there's kind of official truth at the time. I am your father first. The people you live with come second. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a kind of a fanatical indoctrination of children. Um, <clears throat> and Melor, Melor is an example of that and, and Anna, her elder, Sister is not. She's oh. a, you know very much her mother's daughter and a, a born sceptic, which of course places her in danger as well. We know, we know they're all in danger. They're all in danger. And it's a very male book in a lot of ways and most, I mean, as it was in, at the time. But I, you know, maybe this is because I'm biased towards chicks, I don't know. But I found myself really um, absorbed by, I wouldn't say... I mean, I, I really liked Babalina. There is Nasha, who is... Nasha? Datia? Natia. Ha, Natia, thank you. I, I'm not even trying any of the last names. Um, and uh, she is a kind of apparatchik in many ways. Um, but at the same time, she's playing some kind of game. And again, it's about power. And it's sort of... Natia is feminism corrupted, it yeah. seemed to me. Yeah, well, Natia, <clears throat> Natia is Beria's, uh, you know, office number two. Um, it emerges pretty quickly that Natia might be playing the other side or she might be a double agent um, With that, that, you, you, that Beria you, has you in there. Of, yeah, I can't say his name. That's Yezov. The dwarf, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah so Yezov, Nikolai Yezov was um, a real person mm. and uh, Yezov was the head of the NKVD, which was the, the forerunner to the KGB at the time of the Great Terror, 1937. It was, it was called Yezov's Thing that year when, when, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were, you know, so many people were just taken away um, that in the, the end they got to the point where they said they're going to have to start arresting tables and chairs because they've, they've run out of party members to, mm -hmm. to arrest, you know, the Soviet sense of humour. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's all an interesting, you know, fun fact about, about him and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the, this, this atmosphere um, of almost fun with almost terror. Mm. Um, so Yezov ended up getting blamed for the Great Purge. Stalin had to find somebody, you know, it's someone else's fault for a guy like that. Um, <clears throat> and, and Yezov eventually um, took the fall for it. There's a little clip of, there's hardly any film footage at all of um, Nikolai Yezov. There's one clip of him arriving at a, um, the, the, it's a, it's a Politburo meeting and it's in a kind of a palace. And he gets out of the, the, um, the black car uh, with another member of the Politburo, I think it was Khrushchev. And he begins skipping up the stairs, and he's a little guy. He's only about mm. five foot tall and very, very slight. Don't you don't use uh, that yeah. against him. <laughs> um, but the way the lightness of his movement and the way he's laughing, you never see that with with politicians in our world. In in our world that you can imagine, I can't imagine anybody in Australian history who is laughing with such abandon 
as this guy as he's skipping up to a cabinet meeting and you know there's a quote of uh, uh, by one of the participants about the absolute freedom enjoyed by people who have access to the, the you know most violent um, means and you think of the you know the mafia movies the the Coppola um, the Scorsese movies that that we love and there's a you know, there's a scene in Goodfellas where Ray Liotta is laughing almost to split his face open. And um, I did want to, I did want to get right into that, that freedom of laughter among, you know, among butchers. Well, if, I'm going to go to questions in just one second, but you've just popped a thought into my head, which is, if you are going to claim and exercise absolute power, you have to therefore demonstrate absolute ruthlessness because you have to make it clear that your power is so pervasive that it doesn't matter what you do, there is no limit. You can't, and so you have to do the most extreme, the most uh, bizarre, the most cruel, the most unpredictable things because that is the only way you can demonstrate literally, that you do not answer to anyone else. Yeah, no half measures. And, yeah. um, you know, every little, when I was talking about the little dictators in, in um, you know, workplaces and, and families, they have within the bounds of, of their little domain um, uh, one, of the, one of the really, um, you know, essential tweaks of the power machine is, the, is that sense of no limits. And shamelessness. And shamelessness. And, you know, I use the language, this was shortly, at some time when I was writing, it was the time when Putin and um, Xi Jinping signed their, their treaty together and they very proudly called it the No Limits Treaty. And that kind of creeps into the, the, the book as well. Well, Trump saying, getting the Supreme Court to say that the, he, he can do whatever he likes with impunity is a no limits. Yeah, and, and as you, the word you use was shameless, um, the, the, the Soviet Union was equally shameless. You know how Trump says, I could walk along Fifth Avenue and shoot anybody and it wouldn't make any difference. Um, that, that was very proudly the, um, uh, the kind of modus operandi of that regime. And um, it wasn't, there was an enormous bureaucracy of record keeping um, but, you know, that was, that was also a bit of a joke. Everybody knew that the harvest figures and the steel production figures and all of that, everyone knew it was not only incorrect, but they, they had a, you know, a term called um, in-depth language. And, and an example of in-depth language was um, if the government said uh, the, the repression is going to stop now, the in-depth translation of that was the repression's now going to really ramp up and, and everybody's going to cop it. And, and, and the, the, the humble person in the street knew that language. Well, that's what's going on As at we the all moment do, yeah. in the Republican Party, isn't it? Every, every accusation is a disguised confession. OK, 10 minutes to ask questions. Ah, um, oh, there's one already down the front. Um, how did you go about the research? Um, so I wanted the research to, to hold up a bit of a mirror to what I'm talking about. So it, it all gives the appearance of, um, of being true. Uh, and, and I did read yards of, of books. Unfortunately, with the, the, the history of the, that period, um, the archives were opened for a short period under Boris Yeltsin at the end of the Yeltsin regime in the 1990s. And open to, to both Russian and in, international scholars for, I think it was about seven years before Putin shut that access off again. And so there's a great um, treasure house of, of, of material that came out in that, in that little window, which I've, you know, drawn on as, as I, you know, as I want. But I'm a novelist, not a historian, and um, I'm always going to put a preference on the good story uh, and the juicy, the juicy rumour 
over what can be verified. And when we talked before about wheels within wheels, that, that's where you get when you look into this stuff more closely, that facts that are taken as facts because they've been repeated over and over rests on a rumour in the first place, or they rest on a deliberate falsehood when, when you drill right down to the bottom. And there are some absolutely fantastic Soviet era historians, both in the, in the East and in the West, um, but I think all of them would acknowledge the, the tenuousness of the foundations that they're, that they're working on. And I, I kind of liken it to, um, I don't know if anybody's read Mary Beard or saw Mary Beard out here um, last year. She's a wonderful, wonderful historian of the Roman um, emperors. And, you know, she said, because it happened so long ago, and of course record keeping isn't that reliable, we are projecting a lot onto our pictures of Tiberius and um, uh, Caligula and, and Julius Caesar and all the rest. We are, we are kind of f making fiction. Um, in that case, it's because it was so long ago. In the Soviet case, it's because of that, um, that kind of shifting sands in a, in a world where so much cladding and so much pretense of firm research and bureaucratic record was made, but it was all made to conceal the fact that there, were, there was a lie underneath it. Mm. I'm sorry, I was meant to repeat the question and I didn't, oh. and it was, how did you go about the research? Do I, do I have to repeat the answer? <laughs> no, you don't have to repeat the answer. <laughs> I was reminded. There is another question. I'm going to repeat the question before you answer it. Yes, please. So I'm going to repeat the question. This is for the people who are listening online. It was about being interested in the, uh, the kind of complexity between the novelist and the historian and how you reconcile um, being the storyteller and also basing it on, unlike um, the stylists and possibly some other people in our current environment, on fact. Yeah, it's, it's a great question because I think I would answer it completely differently from other historical novelists who are trying to be faithful in some way to the world they're writing about. Um, when I was writing this, I had a very clear um, quasi-political point in mind, which was that I'm imagining myself writing about Trump in 50 years' time or, or you know, Scott Morrison, who seemed relevant then, in 50 years' time. And the... Um, what I see, because they left this record of deliberate lying and, and shameless lying, I see them opening a great big door for the fiction maker to walk into because they were such fiction makers themselves. So it's almost like they surrendered any claim on a historical legacy and you know, I, I think the same will, will happen with Trump, that there will be a lot of novels written about Trump or, or you know, just crap spouted about Trump forever because in his narcissistic you know, hunger for power, he surrendered any, any right. And every, every time he says or implies, I'm telling you a lie, but you know, the cats and dogs, we know that's bullshit. I saw that, I saw that for five minutes on television, somebody talking about it. So I'm going to repeat the rumour here in a debate. I give up any claim on truth for the future. And to a, to a novelist writing, in this case, 80 years after the, the events, I kind of say, well, don't mind if I do. <laughs> that's but I think other historical novelists or, or you know, I, if I would writing about a different period of history would, would answer that very, very differently. That's a really good answer. Um, any more questions from anyone? Yes, <coughs> sir. So, um, you, you know, you probably enter some dark places to get inside some of the characters you're writing about. How do you 
how do you, uh, what's the antidote to that? <laughs> so stay human through the process. Let me, let me repeat that. Um, you go to some very dark places as a novelist, particularly in this book. What's the antidote to that? How do you stay human? <laughs> That's supposing that I, that I have stayed human. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> so did Beria. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you know, my, my beloved is sitting up the back and, you know, with her, with her lips very tightly um, <laughs> buttoned. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question because, you, you know, there are crime novelists who must get that question all the time. But they've, you know, they've gone up into their, their study and written about someone committing some bloody crime and then they've walked down and made themselves a sandwich. Um, <clears throat> and I, I've, I've never really thought about that. Isn't, isn't that a little bit weird and a bit um, psychopathic? That, but <laughs> but it's, it's an imaginary world and um, I guess as a novelist I'm never... I'm, I'm never living and dying in there myself. I'm creating something to, um, if successful, to build an emotional connection with an unknown reader, but I don't have to, I don't have to have blood on my hands to feel, um, to, to, to feel that material and to have that wish to communicate. It's a, it's a really, it's quite a confronting question actually because I have been down this rabbit hole for a long time and, and I've been writing a, another book on it um, since this and um, I think I'm probably a little bit too gutless to really confront that question in myself um, but it's a, it, yeah, ask me again in a year or two when the, but, and, and see how far I've deteriorated by then. As a reader of the book, though, it strikes me that you're writing about this evil to warn us, to elucidate how it works, how power can completely corrupt and destroy societies, families, um, any sense of safety, any sense of fellow feeling. I mean, nobody can have any empathy for anyone else in this world because that is destroyed by Star Wars. Well, yeah, you know, that um, goes without saying, but, it, you know, it's essentially, for me, a story about, about love, um, the love of, um, you know, within this family, um, and also, I think, more so about survival and how to... Um, there's, there's a, uh, again, a term that was used in Soviet Russia called the internal migration, and it was where an individual, you know, an ordinary person like, like any of us, where you went in order to get to the end of the day in one piece. And um, the, the book is very much about the internal migration, and um, I think in it, with all the crap that surrounds us, um, although the, the stakes are quite a lot lower in our world. While yes, I, I, I you know, certainly was thinking, <clears throat> here's a warning of, of, of what we've unleashed at the moment can lead to and has, has led to, but I was much, much more central in my thinking and feeling was um, how, do you, how do you survive when you've got to play by certain rules that you don't agree with, when, when you have to look after people, in a, in a world of compromise, um, how do you get through with your, with things like love and integrity intact? And your sanity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wouldn't guarantee anything about sanity. But, um, yeah. I think Murtoff's sane from beginning to end, to be honest, and Babalina certainly is. Um, we have run, I'm afraid, out of time. Um, we've barely skated across the surface of this extraordinary complex and very, um, very timely book. Uh, there were so many resonances with what's going on at the moment and that probably added to my sweat. Um, we need to thank Malcolm for being here tonight and for answering the questions so beautifully, but I think we also need to thank Malcolm for having the courage and the tenacity to write such a book 
at such a moment. Thank you so much. Thank you.